This world is no friend to grace. It never has been. But yet it is in this hostile world that God has placed his church in order to minister and to operate, to fulfill the mission that God has given to his church. And it's imperative. It's imperative that regardless of the hostility that we face and encounter in this world, that as true believers, we commit ourselves to the Lord and to the gospel without compromise. And this passage before us that is so familiar from your early days, a passage that teaches us that courage and resolve to stand firm comes from faith in God, faith in his promises, faith in his word. The context concerns these three characters, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, minor characters, in the book of Daniel. In chapters one and two, they were companions of Daniel and followers of him, but they took their lead from Daniel. But now in this chapter, they are the center of attention. And after this chapter, they don't appear again. But as we look at this narrative of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, they do teach us some very important lessons as to what it is to live in a hostile world. And that's my theme today, living in a hostile world and emphasizing again that we as believers must, regardless of that hostility, live in a way that is without compromise to the word of God. And there are three thoughts that I want to share with you. First of all, that the world pressures believers to conform. And they make that conformity very attractive. The issue here in our text is this great image that Nebuchadnezzar had erected. No doubt because of the interpretation of the dream that Daniel had given in chapter two, that he was the head of gold and saw himself as superior and that went to his head. And most likely because of that, he erects this enormous statue uh, in his own honor. A statue that was 90 feet high, was nine feet wide. Uh, it was a colossus indeed. And it was a time of celebration as he invited in all of the celebrities uh, of the land to come and to be a part of this celebration. Uh, and they were, were to give the lead to the rest of the people, people there from every part of the kingdom, nations, languages were there. Uh, but it was these celebrities, these leaders that were to give the lead as to uh, how to react and what to do before this great Colossus image. A time I say of celebration, uh, and it's not much different than the day in which we live where it seems that celebrities, uh, either political celebrities or entertainment celebrities or sports celebrities, somehow become the conscience of, uh, of society. Well, it was here that these leaders, I say, were to give the lead as to what should be done. And it was a time of pomp. The orchestra was there. The orchestra was, was there as they sounded their music. Uh, everybody was then to bow down. A time of national celebration, a pledge of unity, uh, at least on the surface given to Nebuchadnezzar, uh, but just to be there. To be a part of this crowd, I say, was attractive. Uh, all of the famous people and all of the well-known people were there. And to be a part of that certainly was making conformity to this very attractive. But they also made nonconformity very dangerous. We read in verse 6 of this burning, fiery furnace that was there along with that image that would be the consequence being thrown into that furnace, the consequence of not bowing down as the instructions were given. So a little furnace there to give a little incentive uh, to make sure that you joined in uh, the celebration. This was some sort of a smelting furnace, most likely, uh, opening at the top, smaller opening there at the bottom. But the smoke and the flames would be billowing, and I say that would 
be a great incentive, putting pressure uh, to make sure that you complied with what the instructions were to bow down to that image when you heard the sound of the music. And certainly when you heard the sound of the music, that was a great incentive to listen carefully so that you could avoid being thrown into this burning fiery furnace. World spirit of tolerance uh, does not exist for those that don't comply. And certainly uh, we know that in our day, uh, the danger today may not be a burning fiery furnace that we are facing, but uh, we know what it is as believers, as Christians, as part of the church uh, to face the lack of tolerance that this world has uh, for us. I see the danger may not be a burning fiery furnace, but there's always the danger as you take your stand, if you're a church, an institution, to lose your tax exempt status, uh, to face lawsuits of some sort or another. And, you know, worst of all, I suppose, to be canceled by this woke society uh, in which we uh, are, are living. Uh, the danger is there. So nonconformity, nonconformity is always a dangerous thing in this hostile world. And nonconformity became conspicuous. In verse 7, the orchestra begins to play. And at the sound of the music, they fell. They fell down. All the, all the people, all the nations, all the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image, except, except Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And how conspicuous that had to be. And perhaps the biggest pressure of all is to be alone. And you can just imagine now that as everybody was bent over, the smoke and the flames of that furnace was now very well in view. They could see it so much better uh, now that there were no other heads in the way. Uh, the smoke uh, and the flames were there before them. But when they were alone, I can only speculate that they, they may have wondered what good, what good is this really doing? Uh, and it, it, it's easy to, to, to rationalize, you know what, uh, we may have thought, I don't know if they thought it or not, but I say we can imagine what the, the rationalization was as they found themselves now as the only one standing, this massive crowd, and everybody is bowed down to this image except themselves. They probably could reason that, you know, if, if we burn in the fire, if we burn in the fire, then there'd be no witness uh, left in Babylon. You know, where is Daniel anyway? Do you see Daniel here today? Uh, but well, there'd be no witness left uh, if, if we were to be burned in this furnace. And after all, doesn't God expect us to obey the authority? So if we bow down, we're just obeying that one that God has placed in authority over us. And, you know, the people may misinterpret what we're doing as being proud arrogance and defiance and they would turn us off in terms of listening to our message. But you know, also if we bow down, if we bow down, everybody else is down here and we could just turn our heads a bit and, and, and give a witness to Jesus. Uh, if, if we could find the ear of those that were bowed down, we could, there's a lifestyle evangelism. I say there are many reasons and many possible rationalizations uh, for not, for not uh, bowing down to the image. But regardless, regardless of how attractive conformity was, the pressure that was placed on them to bow down, uh, they did not bow down. And that raises then the second lesson that I want us to see here. The believers must purpose to commit to the Lord. They must purpose, we must purpose to commit to the Lord regardless of what the potential dangers of nonconformity is in this hostile world in which we live. They were committed, a commitment that was based on the word of God. It wasn't just their petty concerns. It wasn't just their traditions that were causing them to be defiant here, but it was based upon the word of God. Connected with bowing down to this image 
and they recognized it, was also the worship. This was not just a saluting of the flag. This was not just pledging your allegiance to the Babylonian flag or your commitment to Nebuchadnezzar as the civil authority. There was more than just a civil celebration that was taking place here. They recognized that to bow down to that image was to worship other gods, was to worship. And verse 12 makes it clear that when the report came to Nebuchadnezzar, uh, it is said specifically that these have not regarded the OK. They don't serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image that thou hast set up. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego recognized that bowing down to this image would have been the worshiping of a false god. And God's word is clear. They knew the commandments. You must not have any other god before me. And they weren't going to compromise. They weren't going to in any way step across, transgress that very clear commandment that the Lord had given to them. There were religious connotations. And obedience to God's word is not optional. Obedience to God's word is not optional. So notwithstanding the danger, notwithstanding the great threat of that burning fiery furnace, they took their stand. And everybody knew exactly where they stood. They knew exactly where they stood. Absolute testimony to everyone that they knew, that they knew the one true and living God and would not transgress, would not violate that very clear command not to have any other gods before them. But this commitment came regardless of the consequences, regardless of the consequences. Verse 8, wherefore at that time, after the sound of music, after the entire crowd was now bowing down to that image, there must have been somebody who was peeking, frankly, because they saw Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego still standing. But when they saw that, they came, certain Chaldeans came near and they accused the Jews. And literally, the text says they ate the pieces. They ate the pieces of the Jews. Not much different from an idiom that we have of chewing somebody up one side and down the other. They ate the pieces an expression of their hatred, an expression of their absolute anger toward these that were taking their stand. They hated the anger of the world. I'll not be surprised. I'll not be surprised when we as believers in the church today are facing that kind of hatred. Jesus said that the world hated him and therefore it's going to hate you as well. So we ought not be surprised. I'll not be surprised when the world hates us. And I say certainly Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were the objects of this hatred, the ungodly. The ungodly always hate what they do not understand. And this was a spiritual issue. So I'm not surprised that they did not comprehend what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were doing apart from simply their rebellion against Nebuchadnezzar. They interpret their behavior to be strange. Your behavior is antisocial. You're, you're un-Babylonian. You're un-Babylonian. And, and so it is today, right? We take our stand. We take our stand for righteousness. We take our stand for uh, the morality of God's word that uh, must dictate uh, what society is. But the world doesn't have any understanding of that. We're the enemy. The world views believers today and Christians today to be the enemy, the enemy of the gospel or, 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 or the enemy of, of, of American philosophy. We're the un-American. Nobody likes to be ridiculed. Nobody wants to be hated. But the cause of God is more important here than any of our personal feelings. So regardless of the consequences, they took their stand. Interesting as well that they were given an opportunity to reevaluate. They brought Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar said, no, maybe you don't understand. Maybe you don't understand what you were supposed to do. 
when you hear this music, when you hear the music of the cornet and the flute and all those other things, when you hear that music, you're supposed to bow down. You're supposed to bow down and give your allegiance. Do you understand? Maybe you don't quite understand. And they gave him the opportunity then to reevaluate. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, no, no second guessing, no second guessing. They had their uh, they had their resolve fixed. No compromise. Don't need to reconsider. Don't need to reevaluate. But that's always also another ploy that Satan brings to us at times when we see we, we take a stand yeah we take a stand for righteousness we take a stand uh for the truth of the gospel uh, against this in society and, and nothing seems to happen seems to have no effect so what's the use what's the use why bother why bother why don't we just why don't we just pacify them and get on but the result the result of taking a stand is not the criteria for taking a stand. It's the faithfulness. It's the faithfulness to God, the faithfulness to God's word, the faithfulness to truth, to righteousness, that must be our commitment as we live in this hostile world. So there was a commitment regardless of the consequences. But there was a commitment also without arrogance and without presumption. First of all, without arrogance of the king, look at verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, after Nebuchadnezzar had uh, given them the opportunity to reconsider what they had done, they say, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. We don't have, there, we don't have to make a defense. There's no need for us. There's no need for us to make a defense. This is our stand. We understand, we understand what the implications are. We understand what the command was, but we don't have to defend ourselves. But you can see that they did it with respect to the king. They acknowledged the correctness of the indictment that was against them, but they declared no defense. They would not retract. Their separation here, their courage was not characterized by obnoxious they, they 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 had no cantankerous spirit uh, as they took their stand it's important that we don't that, that we don't make our stand for righteousness and our stand for the word of god a self-righteous act i know I, I i've i've been aware of situations people that, that take a stand for truth and it's a truth that I would adhere to. And they take a position that I would agree with. But they do it in such an absolutely obnoxious and arrogant and cantankerous way uh, that I want to separate from them. right? And it does despot to the real cause of the gospel. So we don't take our, we don't rant and rave. All right? We realize what the consequences are, but we do it with respect to the authorities. We do it with respect to those that are over us, but a willingness, a willingness to face the consequences. But we do it with a spirit of Christ likeness. When Christ was accused, we know how he answered his accusers, silent at times. There was no ranting and raving. There was no cantankerous spirit, obviously, in the Lord Jesus. Well, that's our pattern. That must be our pattern. And I say we don't want to do more harm to the truth by the way in which we seek to defend what that truth is. There was no arrogance toward the king, and there was no presumption toward God. They knew what God's will was in terms of not bowing down to that sacrifice or to, to, the, to, that, to that image. But they didn't know. They didn't know whether God would spare them or no. They knew that God was able to do it. God is able to deliver us, but we don't know if he will or not. But nonetheless, 
not knowing the will of God in regard to whether they would be burnt in the burning fiery furnace or no, they took their stand. They weren't presuming upon God. Yes, God is able. They had no doubt that God was able and capable to deliver them and to bring Nebuchadnezzar down low. No doubt about it. But they didn't presume. They didn't presume upon God that God's will would deliver them. That's an exercise of faith. This was not a natural response. This was not a natural response, but it was the exercise of faith, a willingness for God's will at any cost. So there's the commitment. As we find ourselves in this hostile world, a hostile world in so many ways. We must stand for truth, and we must not compromise that truth civilly. We must not compromise that truth with the awareness that God is able to deliver us, if it so be, or not. Commitment to truth. We must commit to truth. And the final lesson is that God promised to accomplish his purpose. In one way or another, in one way or another, God always gets the glory, and that glory is going to include the good of his people. God does not forsake his people. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's not going to be persecution or adversity. They were thrown into the furnace. They were thrown into that burning, fiery furnace. Their commitment and God's glory did not prevent them from the adversity. And you know the story that this furnace was so hot, it was so unbelievably hot that even those executioners that threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in it were themselves slain. They were thrown into the midst of the flames. God's will does not always keep us out of adversity. And certainly we're aware of, in, on our collective prayer meetings on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we often are reminded of the church right across this world that is being persecuted uh, in ways that in our little Western uh, environment are, are difficult for us to comprehend. And some of you coming from cultures and from nations and situations in which you're facing that kind of persecution uh, doesn't mean God's abandoned. So God doesn't always keep his people out of persecution, doesn't always keep him out of the adversity. But, but it does mean, it does mean that God's presence is always with his people. God's presence is always with his people. And we can see that, you know, again, the very familiar story here. As Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are thrown into the midst of that burning, fiery furnace. And as Nebuchadnezzar now looks into that furnace, he says, no, wait, wait. Didn't we throw three people? Didn't we throw three people into that furnace? How come I see four? How come I see four in there? And the fourth one is like, he's like the son of God. He's like the son of God. Now, two questions there. Two questions. First of all, who is? Who is that fourth person in the burning fiery furnace? And the second question is, who did Nebuchadnezzar think he was? All right, two separate questions. I would say, first of all, that Nebuchadnezzar didn't have a clue as to the Holy Trinity, all right? Nebuchadnezzar would not have a clue as to who the second person of the Trinity is, the Son of God. The language there, it's translated in the authorized version with a big S and a big G, uh, that would take us to think of the second person of the Holy Trinity, Christ. But Nebuchadnezzar didn't know that, literally as a son of God. He just simply saw him as a supernatural being. He saw that fourth one as a supernatural character of some sort, but he didn't have a clue as to the Trinitarian existence of the one true and living God. 
So the answer to that question is he just thought it was a supernatural being later on in the text. That one is referred to as an angel by Nebuchadnezzar. But the other question is this, who was it? And I would argue that it indeed was a pre-incarnate, a pre-incarnate manifestation appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ, that Christ himself, pre-incarnate Christophany, made his presence alongside these three Hebrew children, the Son of God. It was Christ. Reminds us of Isaiah 43, verse 2, when thou walkest to the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee, if anyone ever knew the experience of that. It was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they're with them in their persecution, in their adversity. And you, you have to, we have to admit, right, that when Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego were picked up by those executioners and were being tossed into that furnace, they thought that was the end of it. Uh, they thought that was the end of their life. But all of a sudden, they're there walking. They're walking and the flame is not touching them. Their garments aren't being scorched. Their hair is not being singed. They're walking as though they're in a place of paradise. And then there is that one with them, that one with them that they knew indeed was the Son of God, Christ, with them. Not evident to the natural eye, but to the reality of faith. There is no believer, there is no believer that ever takes his stand for Christ alone. You do not take a stand for Christ alone. He is with us. And there's a theology. There's a theology there of, of Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk. Yeah. Yea, though I walk through this valley of the shadow of death, this valley of deep darkness, this valley that is so dark that I can't see there, I can't see there, and the scary stuff that's all around us in that valley of deep darkness. Yea, though I walk. Through that valley of deep darkness, I will fear no evil. I'll fear no danger. Why? Because thou art with me. Because thou art with me. And that constant presence and the assurance that we have of that constant presence with the, of the Lord with his people will encourage us and embolden us to live with that kind of commitment to truth and to righteousness and to God's word in this hostile world in which we live. They were delivered. They were delivered. Others are not. You read the book of Hebrews, right? And you, you see those that were delivered, some through the fire. And I think Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in, in Paul's mind there when he made that statement in Hebrews 11. Others didn't. Others were killed. But they all by faith committed themselves to God and God's presence. God's presence. And let that be our assurance. Let that be our assurance in this day. And I don't know. I'm not a prophet. I'm not the son of a prophet. I, I don't know where this is going and what kind of persecution it's going to be in our day. But in our own land. But I would have to say, you know, in, in my relatively short life, I'm seeing things today that when I was your age, it would never have crossed my mind as a possibility that would be taking place in, in our country today. Uh, and, and the vitriol, the vitriol and the hatred uh, to the church, the hatred of Christ, the hatred to God's word. We're the enemy. We're the enemy to society. Uh, as far as so much of our world is concerned. I don't know where it's going to go. 
I don't know where it's going to go, but I know this. I know this. That the Lord will be with his people. The Lord will be with his people. And that one way or another, in one way or another, God will get the glory. That one way or another, God will get the glory. He did in this text. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were brought out now of the burning fiery furnace, and Nebuchadnezzar is overwhelmed. How did, I don't know how you did this. But it does demonstrate, Nebuchadnezzar says, that there is a God, that there is a God that can deliver out of my hand. And he issued then the decree that went right across the land, that anybody that speaks anything then against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are going to be thrown, their houses are going to be made to a dunghill, <laughs> Strange language, but if, if you know anything about the, the, the Babylonian penalties for transgressing the law, that was pretty, pretty mild, uh, and it would take me very literally here. Uh, but they're good. God got the glory right across the land, right across the kingdom. It became evident that here is a God that is more powerful even than Nebuchadnezzar, more powerful than that one who was the most powerful one on God's earth at that time. God got the glory. God got the glory. So powerful. So powerful is God. So mighty is God that he factors in the opposition, the opposition and the hostility bothers us. It bothers us and it concerns us and it, sometimes it scares us if we're honest. It scares us. But God is so powerful. God is so mighty that he factors in he factors in the opposition, and he factors in the hostility so that when everything is said and done, the glory goes to him and not to any man, not to any church, not to any denomination, not to any seminary. The glory goes to him. He is so powerful. You and I, you know, I, I've taught a lot of you and have made this observation before, I'm sure, but, but, but you think of you, you think of the hostility that I, I say so often scares us and so often discourages us. I say God is so powerful that he factors in. I, I love that statement in Nahum's prophecy. In the opening verses of Nahum's prophecy, you have what is referred to as the song of majesty. Uh, and it makes the statement there that God is great in power slow to anger, or maybe slow to anger, great in power, but it, it, it juxtaposes God's long-suffering and God's greatness of power. Typically, when we think of the long-suffering of God, we think of that in terms of his compassion, and indeed it is. But Nahum links the long-suffering of God with the greatness of God's power. And if I can speak as a fool, God can afford to be as long-suffering as he is because he's as powerful as he is. Every nation works in terms of out of weakness. You know, we see what's going on with this country and that country, and well, let's, we've got to build up our arms if we, so we can, if we build up first, then we're going to deter them, and, and we're afraid, and so we escalate our own armament, whatever in order to reason out of weakness. But no, God, God is not reasoning out of weakness. He's not long suffering. He's not putting things off because of weakness. He's not pacing back and forth the throne of heaven and what to do, what to do. No, he's on his throne. He's on his throne and he is with his people and he is going to govern and he's going to work in such a way that everything worked to the glory of God one way or the other. God gets the glory. I often think of that. You know, when, when Moses was called to go down to Egypt to bring the people out of the land of bondage, and uh, God calls Moses there at the burning bush, right? And he says, Moses, you, I, I, you're going to go down there, and you're going to bring these people out of the place of bondage. And I'm going to tell you right now that when you go into Pharaoh and you tell Pharaoh to say, let my people go, Pharaoh's going to say no. Pharaoh's going to say no, but don't worry. Don't worry. I guarantee you're going to bring the people out and you're going to worship me right in this very place on this mountain. 
that Pharaoh's going to say no. So Moses goes to Pharaoh. He goes to Pharaoh and he says to Pharaoh, let my people go. God says, let my people go. He says, I don't know who your God is. No. And you can almost just see Moses, can't you? You can almost just see Moses say, yeah, don't you love it when a plan comes together, right? This is exactly what God said was going to happen. What if? What if? Tutmosis the third, that's who the Pharaoh was, by the way. What if Tutmosis the third said to Moses, yeah, you know, you, you people have done a lot of work for me. You've done a lot of work for me. Uh, yeah, go ahead and go. Go ahead and go. History would forever be talking about how gracious and how loving Pharaoh was, you see. But no, Pharaoh says no, and God hardened his heart, and he hardened his own heart. And God, by his power and by his grace and by the blood of the sacrifice, brought the people out. He did that for his own glory. He did that for his own glory. So let us not be concerned about the opposition. It's there. But God has factored in that opposition. God has factored in the hostility of this old stinking world in which we live for his glory, for his glory. So let us take the example of these three Hebrew children that we, and they're teenagers here, makes it even more amazing. Let's take their example of their courage, of their boldness, of their commitment to truth regardless regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the threats. For we live in a day, yeah, we live in a day that is hostile to grace, and it's going to be more and more hostile as the days, as the days pass. And I'm concerned for you guys. I'm concerned for you guys. You guys are at the age where you're going to be going out into a ministry that in so many ways was different than the ministry I world that I came into. And I'll be honest, you face it, you know, most of most of my ministry is behind me. Most of yours is before you. Seemingly, God knows. I don't know what the world's gonna be. I fear for my grandchildren. I fear for, you know, it's it's it's, it's a hostile world. But God is on his throne. God is on his throne and God is going to get the glory. May God enable us, may God enable us as his people to stay firm, not to be cantankerous, not to be obnoxious, but to stand firm for the cause of righteousness for the sake of the gospel. Amen. Oh Lord, seal thy word to our hearts and give us each one the, the courage to stand for truth, not for anyone's glory but thine. We pray in Jesus' name.